Hello, and welcome to another one of Mr. Deep in Science lessons. For today's session, you're going to need a book, a pen, and in your book, I'd like to get down today's title, which is Extinction and Preserving Biodiversity. For our Star Trek activity, I would like you to consider that the last documented sighting of the dodo was in 1662. It had lots of food and no natural predators. I would like you to suggest why the dodo went extinct. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. So before we talk about the dodo, I want to talk about what we're going to look at today. We're going to define extinction and describe how a species can become extinct. We're going to explain how extinction affects other organisms within the ecosystem, and describe how extinction can be prevented by conservation, captive breeding, and gene banks. So the dodo became extinct because there was the introduction of a new predator. This new predator was us, humans, and it is documented that travelers ate lots of dodos. On all their ships, they also brought another predator, which were rats. And the rats didn't eat the dodo, but the rats did eat the dodo eggs. And with less of the dodo surviving and less of the dodos reproducing, then the dodo eventually became extinct. But there are other factors which can cause extinction, such as the change in the habitat, such as the pH of a river or lake. It could be because of the destruction of a habitat, either by human intervention, such as deforestation, or more natural causes, such as fires which occur in drought seasons. It could be that there is an outbreak of a new disease. It could also be new predators, like in the case of the dodo, and it could also be the introduction of other animals which means that there'd be an increased competition for resources, which is what happened to the red squirrel in the UK when the grey squirrel was introduced. Some other reasons a species could become extinct are extinction level events. Now these don't happen over a long period of time. These are catastrophic events, such as an ice age, or a meteor hitting the earth, or volcanoes erupting. Things that cause a huge loss of life and can wipe out species in a very short period of time. And with all these reasons for extinction in mind, I would like to consider the following. Rail birds like this moorhen and the coot used to inhabit 20 islands in the Pacific Ocean, but now they only inhabit five. I want you to suggest three reasons for the disappearance of these birds from the other islands. And if you really want a challenge, I'd also like to consider that biologists can be certain of the appearance of these birds for this challenge, I'd like to suggest why these biologists cannot be certain about the appearance or the colour of the dodo. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. So now let's have a look at why these birds only inhabit five of the 20 islands that they used to inhabit. These birds could have not survived on these islands because of the destruction of a habitat, because there may have been a new disease outbreak, there may have been some new predators that were introduced, it could be that there was increased competition for resources. Did you have a go at the challenge as to why biologists can be certain of the appearance of this bird and not the dodo? It is because there is photographic evidence of this bird existing. This bird also still exists today. The dodo doesn't exist. No one ever took a picture of a dodo, and the only thing we've got to base the appearance of the dodo on are recollections in travellers' journals. So although we have a general idea of what it looked like, we can't know for certain exactly what the dodo looked like. Although we can be quite certain about its size and shape because there are fossils of dodos. So we can describe how a species can become extinct and define extinction as there being no more of that species left alive. But how does the extinction of one organism affect the other organisms within an ecosystem? To do this, we're going to quickly recap food chains. I want to know what the arrows in a food chain mean, I want you to identify the producer, and I want you to identify the predators and their prey in this food chain. And if you really want a challenge, I'd also like to know what would happen to all the other organisms if the sparrow became extinct. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. So, these arrows represent the transfer of energy. So the energy is transferred from the plant to the caterpillar, 
the energy is transferred from the caterpillar to the sparrow, the energy is transferred from the sparrow to the sparrow hawk. The producer in this food chain is the plant because it makes its own glucose by the process of photosynthesis. There are two predator-prey relationships in this food chain. We've got the sparrow and the caterpillar, where the sparrow is the predator and the caterpillar is the prey, and we've got the sparrow hawk and the sparrow, where the sparrow hawk is the predator and the sparrow is the prey. Did you have a go at the challenge? What would happen to all the other organisms if the sparrow became extinct? Well, looking at just this food chain, the sparrow hawk wouldn't have anything to eat, so that would decrease in number and possibly become extinct. Because there's nothing eating the caterpillar, the number of caterpillars will go up, and if there's more caterpillars, they're going to eat more plants, which means the number of plants will go down. But then if there's less plants, more caterpillars are going to go hungry and die, which means the caterpillar numbers are going to come down again. And when the caterpillar numbers come down, that means the number of plants can increase, which means there will be no net change in the number of plants and the number of caterpillars. It will stay about the same. But we know in an ecosystem, it's a bit more complex than just this food chain. Instead, we have food webs. So we have our sparrow hawk eating the sparrow, eating the caterpillar, eating the plants. But there's also a snail which eats the plants, and that snail is going to be eaten by the sparrow. There's also a vole, and this vole is going to eat the caterpillars. But our sparrow hawk is also going to eat the vole. In our food web, we've also got frogs, and our frogs are also going to eat the caterpillars. And our sparrow hawk is also going to eat the frogs. But there's also the fox, which is also going to eat the frogs. But the fox doesn't just eat the frog, it also eats the rabbits. And our rabbits need something to survive, and our rabbits also eat the plants. And the more species you have in an ecosystem increases the amount of biodiversity. And biodiversity is defined as the number of different organisms living in that ecosystem. Now we're going to have a look at the previous challenge task, but in this food web. What would happen to all the other organisms if the sparrow became extinct? And if you really want a challenge, you can have a look at how many food chains you can find in this food web. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you finish, we'll go through the answers together. So let's run through this systematically. Last time we started with the sparrow hawk, we can see because there's less sparrows, the number of sparrow hawks is going to go down. Because the vole has less predators, the number of voles is going to go up. The number of frogs is also going to go up. But because there's more frogs and voles, that means that more caterpillars are going to get eaten. And because there's less things eating the plants, that means the number of plants is going to go up. But wait, if the number of frogs and voles increases, why does the number of sparrowhawks have to decrease? Well, it doesn't. Over time, the number of sparrowhawks will come back up to its original quantity. And now, because there are more sparrowhawks, this means that the number of frogs and the number of voles is also going to come back down to its original amount. And because there is the same amount of frogs and voles, this means that the number of caterpillars is going to start to increase again. And because our number of caterpillars is staying the same, then our number of plants is also going to stay the same. And this shows the importance of biodiversity. Because if something happens to one of the species in a complex food web, then overall there would be no net change. A large biodiversity would ensure that all the species living within that ecosystem don't go extinct if there is a disruption to its food web. So how many food chains did you find in this food web? If you're really sure about your answer, I'd like to hear about it down in the comments below. So now we can explain how extinction affects other organisms within an ecosystem. And we looked at this in terms of food chains and food webs, and it had a bigger impact on the food chain because there was less biodiversity. And it had a much smaller impact on the food web because that large biodiversity ensures that there is no net change or very little disruption to the rest of the ecosystem. So we can take measures to prevent extinction and we can monitor species and when their numbers become really low then we can declare them at risk of becoming extinct. And animals who are at risk of becoming extinct are called endangered species. And included in these endangered species are the giant panda and the amur leopard. But to help protect these endangered species we can set up conservation areas. These areas protect the endangered species natural environment. Therefore, there's going to be less disruption to their food web. We can also set up captive breeding programs. This is where we take the animals out of their natural environment and we breed them in controlled conditions. This generates a stable and healthy population, which can then be reintroduced into the wild to help increase the numbers of the species to ensure their survival. 
but this only happens when the number of a species is quite low in the first place. And because of this, it means there's going to be less genetic diversity. And because these animals were bred in captivity, when they're released into the wild, they sometimes lack the behavioural traits which allow them to survive in the wild. We can also prevent extinction and preserve biodiversity using gene banks. And this is more for preventing extinction and preserving the biodiversity of plants, such as this one here, the Svalbard gene bank. And these gene banks contain seeds which have been dried and stored at very low temperatures so they can survive for a long period of time. They also contain tissue banks which have cells from plants and they are also stored at low temperatures. And they also have cryobanks where seeds and embryos of organisms are stored in liquid nitrogen. And this includes both plants and animals. They also have pollen banks where they've stored pollen grains which help fertilise remaining plants. And with that in mind, what I'd like you to do is to evaluate the three methods used for conservation. And remember, when you do an evaluate question, you need to give your own opinion at the end as to which one you think is the best method for conservation. And if you really want a challenge, you can also research some of the other advantages and disadvantages for each method. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. If you need more time, pause the video. And when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. You got your evaluation? Let's start looking at conservation. Conservation is there to preserve food webs and it provides other species with varied diets. Captive breeding ensures that we have stable and healthy populations. But it comes at the cost of decreased genetic diversity and the animals when released into the wild lack behavioural adaptations. And a further point to that decreased genetic diversity, it also means that they're going to be more prone to new diseases. Our gene banks have samples of species which can be reintroduced after they have been removed from the wild. And this has got other advantages because many plants are the basis of many modern day medicines. So it helps to preserve those plants. And because a lot of medicines are isolated from plants, undiscovered medicines still have a chance of being discovered if a plant goes extinct. And remember, this is an evaluate question. So you do need to write a conclusion. Which one of these do you think is the best and why, and there is no wrong answer. So now we have described how extinction can be prevented by conservation, captive breeding, and gene banks. Which means there is one more thing I would like us to do, which is to have a look at this. This is a task we've done once before, and I'd like you to describe the predator-prey relationship of the fox and the rabbit in the graph. But I also want you to comment on the biodiversity of the ecosystem that they live in. Yes, the numbers of both of these fluctuate up and down, but I want you to relate that to there being a net change. Is there a net change in the population of rabbits and foxes? And if you really want a challenge, you can state why the maximum number of rabbits is greater than the maximum number of foxes. But that covers all you need to know about extinction and preserving biodiversity. I hope you've had a great lesson and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the lesson. If you found it useful, don't forget to press the like button. And why don't you subscribe and press the bell icon as well so you know when the next lesson's available. You can also support me on Patreon and you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter and I appreciate all the support. And I'll see you next time.